So uh, let's start the second part of this morning. Uh, now we will talk about uh, auto microbial. Uh, that's my uh, my life actually. <laughs> and uh, from Professor Purnima, it's uh, the responsible for that. <laughs> so uh, thank you again, Professor. Please. Thank you, let's continue. So you're all brave, those of you who showed up for the second session, I'm proud of you. So, so let's talk a little bit about risk, risk assessment. So we talked about how we're gonna fill these buckets, right? So, so that's a big bucket that's left open. And, and we're gonna now talk about the work that we are doing in this space. And of course, you folks are also contributing in a large way to this space. And, and how, what it takes to, to um, this one, but some of you are familiar with this with this place here. That is called the Horseshoe Mobile. Yes. So this, we are we are from I'm from the Ohio State University. So so we don't take anything seriously but football. So to us, football is religion. This we last night at dinner we were talking about this. This stadium here holds a hundred and twenty-five thousand visitors. Forget the people who are playing, the staff, that is, doesn't count. So just the space here is 125,000 people on a game day. And believe me, the seats are sold two years in advance. So if you bought a ticket, you have to buy it outside, right? You have to buy it on a resale, you cannot get tickets. So, so we, are, we are very, very, in this place, the band does something very special. They do what is known as Script Ohio. So, so they play the band and then they write Ohio. This is probably the only band in the world that takes dental treatment very seriously. This is Postal Hall. This is where my clinics are. So, Henato, you have seen this, but from here up to this place now, Mabeli, when you come back, you people will not recognize this because the new building is coming starting from here all the way extending along Neal Avenue. So where Jimmy Johns is, right across from that, we're getting the whole new building now. So you will not recognize this when you two come back. So please, if you haven't seen it before, come see visit us now next. If you have seen it before, you will not. So it's a new place, so it's not old at all. So please come back and visit again. So we're, we're more than happy to, to have you folks come back and visit. Brenda, you will not know this place anymore. So <laughs> come back and see it again. It's, it's completely different. So. So we're building right now, there's a big, this, this sign doesn't exist because this place is completely dug up. There's a big hole in the ground. We're going to fill it. We're getting a completely new clinical space. So 2020 will be a good time to visit to see our new facility. So please do come, come visit. So uh, let me see if this place, our band is very, very special. This is the only band in the world that takes dental treatment very seriously. This band here is gonna do the floss dance. Let's see if that works. Yes, no? Maybe not. Ah, never mind. Ah, wait, you know what? Maybe it'll work like this. Let's see. Let's go back one. Yeah, right there. Oh, it'll play. You don't need the sound. It's just, yeah, I think that should play. I think it should work. Let's see. Yeah, it's thinking about it. It's thinking about it. Let's see, it's spinning there. So if it does the floss dance, you can see the floss dance. If it doesn't do the floss dance, I'll tell you that our band does the floss dance. It's very slow. It's very slow. Hmm? Oh, that's for the sound, right? Yeah, it's okay if it does no sound. I don't think it's gonna play. So there went the floss dance, doesn't matter. All right, so, so in this place, we do a lot of, lot of fun work. So, so uh, <coughs> I, I call this Ubuntu. Ubuntu is a African word, which means I am because we are. What you're seeing today is just the face of my lab. When I'm standing here as Pranima Kumar, this is not just me. There are about 70 more talented people than I standing behind my back. Some of them are sitting here in front of me. So I have this whole group of incredibly intelligent, bright, driven young people who work with me, who have chosen my lab. I didn't choose them, they choose me. 
And what I'm showing you today is their hard work. So really, this is nothing to do with me. This is, I'm simply showcasing the work that my students and my collaborators and my colleagues do. So I'm just the voice of all of these people. So I am because they are, right? So we function as a group and, and we, are, we are very collaborative. We do a lot of fun stuff together and with other people. And within Ohio State, we collaborate with, with uh, so Christina and Elizabeth are, are um, infectious diseases. They are urologists, pediatric urologists. And with them, we are studying the female microbiome. I call it the her biome. So we're studying the female microbiome and, and understanding in all different human parts, you know, in the oral cavity, the rectum, the vagina, all of these areas, different mucosal surfaces are their male-female differences and how they impact the health of the child, correct? And then this here, um, Brad, Brad Needleman and Sabrina Noria are both of them um, um, bariatric surgeons. And so with them, we are studying how uh, weight obesity changes um, oral health. Ben O'Donnell is an endocrinologist. With him, we are doing some work on diabetes. And this is my tobacco and e-cigarette group. Micah Berman is not, is not a dentist. He is not a biologist. He is not a computer specialist. He is a lawyer. So I am not kidding you. Because I'm working on e-cigarettes, I am so afraid of being sued. I have a lawyer on my team. Yes, so, so I have him. And of course, Dr. Nagaraja is, is an incredible statistician. He's absolutely brilliant. He looks at data in ways that we cannot even imagine. So sometimes he looks at me and says, what is this analysis, why not that? So, so we work with him on that. And then, you know, this is one group that I'm very, very proud of. This is our bioremediation group. The, Steve Clinton is a uh, oncologist. Yale Waterwatts is a food scientist. And Steve Schwartz is a metabolomics person. So with them, we collaborate to understand how food-based nutrients so we study black raspberries and soy proteins, but truly we are a land-grant university, which means at Ohio State, most of our resources come not from tuition, but actually the land that we rent out to, to our farmers. So a big, big group, a big purpose of our existence is to take crops to the clinic. So how food can impact, so functional foods. So we are big in this element of functional foods. I mean, you can say, yes, a smoker is going to have more disease, an obese person is going to have more disease. If you're stressed, you're going to have more disease. So yes, but how do you change it? You know, you, not, a smoker is not going to quit. An obese person is not going to lose weight overnight. How do you help them reduce the harmful effects, bioremediation, right? So, so we are looking at those things, and, and they are not to replace therapy. We are never in the business of replacing therapy. We are more in the business of preventing disease. So this is chemo prevention. This is not chemotherapeutics, because chemotherapeutics is a very, very shaky space, and I really don't think you can do, find a treatment that can take the place of a 15C blade. I think the best thing we have is a 15C blade, so I really don't think we can, we can change that. So we are in the business of chemo prevention. And you know, you can always treat that one patient who is in your chair that day, but how do you treat the 100 other patients who didn't get an appointment with you or who could not get an appointment with you or did not know you existed, right? So, so essentially, healthcare has to go back to the hand of the patient. It cannot be with us. So we are, we're in that wellness model, and so this is the team that I work with. So this is that group that did the classification. If you look very, very, very closely, very carefully, you will see me there, some, there, right? Actually, I'm only seen in the American version of the picture. In the European version of the picture, it was taken from, from, from this angle. No, it was taken from this angle, so Massimo is completely hidden me, completely hidden. So, you in the, so if you look at the same picture from the EFP in the Journal of Clinical Perio, you won't even see me. That's how little and how back I was. But I was a small cog in this huge, huge group of, of I mean, every, every person you have read in your literature survey, right? Um, Vince Icono, Klaus Lang, Dennis Kinane, I mean, you name it, the word, right? So, so Jack Caton, um, Mariano Sanz, I mean, just say the word, uh, Tonetti, Panos, Papa Pano. I mean, the names, just say it. There is, there is a Trombelli somewhere there. Uh, I think Chambron was there, Magda Ferres is somewhere in this picture. You know, there's, there's a whole bunch of different people. So, 
So 110 of us got together, and I was extremely lucky to have gotten on that committee, and, and I told you the battles we went through, right? So I'm not going to revisit the classification, but following from that, we started saying, okay, this bucket of risk needs to be filled. Let us see how many drops we can use to fill this bucket. So I'm going to talk to you a second about risk. So we have always been assessing risk. This is nothing new. 2017 did not come up with this. We have been assessing risk for a very, very, very long time. In fact, we have been assessing risk from 400 BC. Back in the day, periodontitis was thought of a disease of the old. So basically, when you grow old, your, your hair becomes white, you are, you know, your knees become tired, and, and, and you also have teeth that fall out, that get loose and fall out. And so just like you took care of your old grandparents and parents, you took care of, of the disease, right? You did not treat it actively. There was, it was not considered to be treatable. It was simply considered, yes, they have lost teeth, now help them you know, eat soft foods or something like that. So, so care, not cure, was the paradigm. So nobody treated the disease, right? And in fact, if you look at as early as 19, as late as 1955, this is a very famous study by Marshall and Day. What they showed was this is the number of years and this is the number of teeth lost, right? So they showed that as people get old, there will be continuous loss of teeth and continuous loss of attachment, no matter how you look at it in different age groups and different categories, that people will eventually get disease. So this is something that you did not escape. So it was thought of as an endowment, as a natural effect. Just like you cannot ex escape gray hair, you cannot escape losing teeth or periodontitis. So that was, that was the condition, right? Which meant that we were very passive about treating disease, about you know, curing it, about finding a way of preventing it. If you can't prevent white hair, you can't prevent tooth loss. Done. That was the attitude we had right then, back then, right? And then the low and brown studies and that era came up, so from the 1980s to 1990s, people found out that susceptibility to disease varies. So you all know the Sri Lankan studies, right? There was a group of individuals who had very, very high amounts of plaque, but really no disease. So this is plotted age on this axis. That last point is greater than 45 years. This is bone, uh, bone attachment loss plotted over this axis. So there's a group of individuals who have absolutely no attachment loss over life. And then there is a group of individuals who have attachment loss and it kind of increases at 45 years of age. And there's this group of individuals who had attachment loss at a very early age and by 45 there's no data point because they have lost all of their teeth, right? So people found out that susceptibility to disease varies, which means that you know not everyone is gonna get gray hair, Maybe somebody will get gray hair much earlier in life, and some people will not grow gray till 70 years of age. They will still look very, very young. Depends, right? So that kind of an attitude, that susceptibility is different. And that began the 100-year war. So the 100-year war was basically between two groups, one known as the localists, who believed that periodontitis is a local disease. You have plaque, you will get disease. You have a tooth, you will get periodontitis. What is the simplest way of treating periodontitis? Extraction. If you remove the tooth, there is no more periodontitis, right? So extraction. So considering that because it's a local disease happening because there is a tooth and a periodontium, it was considered a local. So this is this very big group, right? And this person in the center, you know who he is? This is Harold Lowe. He was the director of NIH, NIDCR as we know it today. This is Harald Lowe, the Lowe and Sildner studies, same guy. So, so this is Pierre Fouchard, this is Harald Lowe. So all of these people basically believe that periodontitis is very, very specific. It affects only the tooth. It only causes destruction of the periodontal structures. There is no internal cause, you know, and, and local intervention. So, so this started the whole hygiene therapy, scaling, root planing, surgery treat it locally. If you can open that flap, if you can get rid of the local factors, if you can reduce the local inflammation, you can treat periodontitis. So that was the fundamental concept, and that still holds good today. We are very, very, very good at this. But then, there's a group that came out and said, wait, wait, just because you treat them, the diabetic doesn't heal well, the smoker doesn't heal well, the obese person doesn't heal well, so clearly there is a systemic component to this which we are you know, ignoring. And of course, the systemic people went to the entire other side of this thing. They said, they called them, you know, they said, it's all about a systemic inflammation, right? So they said, local irritation is not, and this is, 
This is W.D. Miller here. So this is the man who wrote all about the caries and everything. So that's Miller there. He said local irritation is not the only, only thing. And basically, there are remote causes that decrease the resistance of the periodontium to disease. And because of that, it makes it a lot more susceptible. And that susceptibility is what? So, so basically, what you can do is you cannot always control the remote factors. So basically, it's chronic disease management. So periodontal disease is chronic disease management. It doesn't mean one treat and done, right? So, so both of these concepts together drive what we do. You treat it locally, but you manage it systemically, right? So the treatment that we provide is immediate, but the maintenance phase involves a lot of systemic factors. So, so truly, this is where we are today. And this is how the whole risk assessment process began. Along with this, we also learned different ways. It changed our thinking, right? As we started talking about risk, over the years, we started thinking about different aspects of the disease. The first thing, so I'm calling this the age of Aquarius. Age of Aquarius is increase in knowledge, right? Aquarius is when, when knowledge started increasing. So we are in the age of Aquarius now. And so basically what they found is that things changed that disease incidents cannot be explained by local factors alone. We saw this with the Sri Lankan studies. The other study that came out was that aggressive periodontitis, or what was known as aggressive periodontitis, has a very strong familial aggregation, possibly a genetic background, right? So there is that. They found that, okay, so genetics has a role. It's not always, and 50% of the variability in chronic periodontitis can also be explained by genetics. So it is not simply bacteria equals disease. It also means that there are other factors involved in that. And so as we started doing that, people started thinking of different treatment goals. And we've gone through a whole evolution on treatment goals here, right? From 4000 BC to 1960. So this were the instruments that the tooth cleaning slaves of Rome and Arabia used, right? So they actually had slaves who would come in and clean your teeth, and these were those instruments that they used. And our ultrasonic scalers are, and our scalers and ultrasonics are just a modification of the same instrument. So from until 1960, for almost, what, 1,000, 2,000 years, we've been using instruments that were very, very, very similar, right? So it was mechanical removal of plaque. The, the fundamental thing was mechanical removal of plaque, right? Anybody who sat down, what did they teach you? First year, second year of dental school? On models, we sat down how to adapt instruments, the Gracie's curet, ergonomics. We spent a lot of time on that. Mechanical plaque removal became very, very important. And then people said, wait, from 1965 to 1985, this was the golden age of microbiology. People said, wait, mechanical plaque removal is not enough. All plaque has to be removed. Specific pathogens within plaque have to be removed, which means antimicrobial therapy. That became really, really big, right? We started prescribing antibiotics for what was called refractory disease. We started prescribing antibiotics for the aggressive periodontal conditions. We started prescribing antibiotics along with other treatments. Mouthwashes became very big. And then, of course, lasers, right? We use lasers for um, antimicrobial properties. And that became the biggest age when toothbrushing, powered toothbrushes, so removal, mechanical removal, right, including chlorhexidine, all of those therapies started becoming important, so we started getting chemotherapeutic approaches, either straight antibiotics or antimicrobial, or simply just chemotherapeutics. So all of that, the whole spectrum, the whole range of it opened up for us. In 1996, Steve Offenbacher, God rest his soul, did one of the greatest things ever. He took the mouth and put it back into the body, right? He said, we are not going to work by ourselves. We are not simply dentists. We are oral physicians. So, so the body has a big effect on the mouth. But more importantly, things in the mouth have a huge effect on the body. So the periosystemic link was established. And he coined the term periomedicine. So the 1996 EFP brought out this word called periomedicine, and so they said not only local factors, local chemotherapeutics, but we also need to control systemic factors and how that changed, right? So that changed the philosophy. And the other thing that we did was we went from what is known as the repair model. When I was a student in India in dental school, oh my gosh, how many years ago now? We were told a chance to cut is a chance to cure. So all of these are very famous terms. As our surgeons would come in and say, cold steel is the best deal. Pick up your blade, pick up your blade. So everything, if you can cut it, you can cure it. Open it, when in doubt, open it. 
So we cut everything. We, we did surgery everywhere. We cut everything. I think there is calculus here, doctor, open it. I think there is plaque here, open it. So, so we opened everything. You know, the whole thing was repair. You never saw a patient until they had disease. So patient comes to you with disease, you fix the problem, you send them back home, right? So this was the repair model, and this is not just for perio, everything. Patient says, I have a cavity, you fill it. Patient says, I have gum disease, you treat it. Patient says, I have blood pressure, you treat it. So this is the repair model of therapy, right? So, so a patient comes, a patient is only a patient when they have disease. Until then, they are your friend, your colleague, they're the person on the street, right? So, so this was our understanding of our interaction with other people in terms of who we are as medical people. But then we have now changed to the wellness model. So when you say, I'm going to treat you, the fundamental understanding is that you take the responsibility for making the patient better. But in fact, this is not just that. We can't fix everything that's wrong with the patient because once you let the patient go to their house, there is all those things that the patient does that they have an equal responsibility in taking care of chronic diseases as much as we do, right? No amount of uh, I, I know anti-glycemic medication will help the patient if they are constantly drinking four Cokes a day, right? They don't work out. No amount of hypertensive medication will drink if they open a bag of potato chips every day. So same concept. Nothing that you do will work 100% if the patient goes home and continues with everything that they're doing. So this is the wellness model. You shift the responsibility from your hands to the patient's hands. And so an important part of the wellness model is prevention. Even before you see the patient, even without seeing a patient, you can influence their care. You can start by preventing disease in this patient so they will never come to your chair, right? that becomes important. And that is, again, it's not simply in a patient who has never had disease. We talked about the reduced periodontion, the patient with disease experience. You can do what is known as secondary prevention. So once they've had disease, you can make sure it never comes back again. So you get primary prevention, you get secondary prevention, patient who has never been in your chair, patient who has been in your chair. So we're going into the wellness model. This works in large populations. You don't have to see every patient to make a difference in their life. You can make a difference even without them being in your chair. You know, they are more responsible, so they feel like they have to do something. They feel like, I am paying them money, let me. So if you buy an expensive pair of shoes, you will put shoe polish on it. You will take care of it. You will not walk in a puddle, right? Because you know that it's your shoe. But if you don't think it's your health and it's your disease, then you're not going to take care of it. You think, I paid the doctor, they need to take care of me. That's not, the, that's not the equation here, right? The equation is that it's still your body. You may pay the doctor, but it's still your body. And you need to do things that make you better. The problem here is they don't know what they need to do. And we don't know what to tell them. They'll ask you, OK, what should I do? Should I quit smoking? Is that it? Is it OK if I quit smoking but not lose weight? Right? And we don't have the answers to this, right? So, so we are really trying to find out what should you tell the patient? So prevention, saying yes, you have to prevent disease is very easy, but what are the elements of preventing disease or secondary? So that is truly what we're trying to do here, right? So, so let's talk about risk for a second. What is risk, basically? Risk is the odds that any event can lead to a negative outcome. I'm gonna take a simple, exp ex a simple example. How many of you text, right? Yes, of course, you all text. How many of you text while you're driving? It's okay. There. See, thank you. You're at least honest. I, so, so let's take this. This is, yes. Hey, come on. How many of you sent at least one text while you were driving? You don't have, right. Hey, who hasn't? If you haven't, then you're not busy enough. That's all I'm saying. That's all I'm saying. So, so, but, <laughs> so we all text and drive. Or we have at least sent a text while we have driven, right? So this is a statistic from the fatality analysis reporting system. So basically, the United States has a fatality analysis reporting system. And it tells you that your odds of getting into a traffic accident due to texting while driving, right? There are different factors. Not everybody who texts and drives will get into a traffic accident. We all have done it. I'm going to say 90% of this room haven't gotten into a traffic accident. It's not because we're very good at driving or we're very good at texting. Right? It's, it's not. Why? What keeps us? Right? 
So then you look at start breaking out, breaking down that data, right? You start looking at why did we not get into a traffic accident? So, so I went to this website and it says, the frequency of texting matters. Each text that you send increases your risk by 2.3%. Okay, and I'll, I'll put all this in the context. Let's just follow along here. Play this game with me for a second. The duration of text. So if you're texting for every second, increases your risk by 0.9%, okay? The type of text you send. If you're just sending a picture, it's 0.08%. If you're actually typing, it's 1.2%. If you're receiving a text, it is 0.3%, okay? So if you're reading a text, all of these things. The location matters, but they don't know enough to put a number on it. They know that, you know, being on a highway increases your risk more than your you know, increasing. So they know more or less, so this is not a number game yet, okay? So this is the data you get. So then you take this, hold on, I'm gonna go back. I'll, I'll come back to all of this, yes. So then, okay, let's, let's do this this way. It's much, much, much easier, okay. So you take that kind of an examination, this, this kind of data, and we'll apply it to the oral cavity. We'll apply it to the oral cavity, right? So basically, when you look at it, what elements of risk? We are assessing risk for periodontal disease. You can do it at the patient level. You can do it at the whole mouth level. You can do it at the tooth level. You can do it at the site level, right? And so basically, hold on, I'm gonna get at this. Here it is. So at the patient level, you can look at oral hygiene, their motivation. We just talked about bone loss in relation to age. We can look at genetic factors, systemic factors. At the tooth level, you can look at mobility, residual periodontal support, restorations, tooth, you can, there's a whole bunch. I don't even have to read this to you. Just saying there are lots of factors, right? So people have taken these factors and they have put them into algorithms. The one of the most loveliest ones is this by Lang and Tonetti. Have you all done this on the web? Do you do this for your patients? I do this a lot for a lot of my patients in my practice. It's very easy, you just go to the website and you can start filling in these boxes. So this, this thing opens up. So if you open up this website, this opens up. So ba the, basically the way it is is they're using four local elements and two systemic elements to explain risk. So bleeding on probing, probe depth greater than five millimeters, tooth loss due to periodontitis. Now it's due to periodontitis, but back then it was just tooth loss. Bone loss as a ratio of age, okay? Here is a systemic or general factor, which is diabetes. That was all they were using then. And here is environment, which is smoker, yes or no, okay? So you can take these factors and it lists them down here. And as you add things, so this is the patient who's 35 years of age, who has had, you know, lost four teeth, has, you know, uh, six teeth with probe depths greater than five millimeters, and so you start filling these boxes and it tells you if the patient is high risk. The same patient, if they have you know, no BOP, all teeth are present, they're a non-smoker, it gives a very small box like this and it tells you it's a low risk, all right? So you, we use these factors. Good, this is a great risk assessment tool. Four local factors, one systemic, one environmental factor, so we have a risk assessment tool. There's a little more complex one. This charges you $6 per patient per visit. It's called Provisor. It takes a lot more factors into, into uh, account. And it tells you this, sorry. Then you have the Unifi by Trombelli, who took the same, he took the same Lang and Tonetti, but now he gave it subcategories. Remember, just like this classification system where we looked at the amount of smoking, the HPA1C levels, they subclassified this. So basically, this is what they did. Remember, smoking was, a, was a, uh, in that web, it was one line there. So they gave it a zero to four. Diabetes, HbA1c, they want zero to four. So everything they subdivided into categories except for bone loss as a age, percent of age, and they gave it a zero to eight. And so now the risk increase. So you can have absolutely low risk, medium low, medium, medium high, and high. So they expanded this a little bit. So basically the Lang and Tonetti and the Unifi are just expanded versions of each other, right? So we have another risk assessment tool, great. So then the question became, how are we doing? How are these risk assessment tools working for us? And this is what happened. So when you look at it, this is the provisor tool, right? All of these lines that you're seeing here, I'm sorry, this bottom line you can barely see, that is risk assessment of one, it's running here. Then you have the blue line, which is risk of score. Risk score of two, risk score of three is the red line, Green is risk score of four, and purple is risk score of five. This is bone loss, percent bone loss. This is age. 
So three years after diagnosis, nine years after diagnosis, 15 years after diagnosis. So people who were diagnosed as low risk had literally no bone loss over a long period of time. People who had a risk score of two also had very minimal bone loss. And people who had a high risk score over 15 years, they had a lot of bone loss. So it works great. You can predict which patient is going to have bone loss at baseline, which is great. And then they said, let's compare Provisor and Unifee. And they found that there are very, very good agreement statistics between both of them. So it doesn't matter whether you use Provisor or Unifee or Trombelli. It seems to be working very well. Great, great. Everybody was very happy. Yes, we know how to do risk. Then, of course, somebody had to do something crazy, right? So they went and did the study. They took three patients in each group, right? So there are 15, oops, sorry, sorry, sorry. They took 15 patients. And you will see these 15 patients as white line. Do you see these white triangles here? Three white triangles, three white, three white, and three white. Are you able to see it? Is it clear enough for you guys? OK, so this is the risk score on the x-axis, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So there are 15 patients here, three patients with a risk score of 1, three patients with a risk score of 2, so on and so on. Then they took 100 dentists and periodontists. They gave them these 15 patients and say, assign risk score. Assign the risk score. Tell us, what is your risk score for this patient using Unifee, using Trombelli? <coughs> Give us a risk score. What they found was, Patients with low risk, one and two, most physicians, most dentists, practitioners, gave it a higher score than what it was supposed to be. Does that make sense to everybody? Most people hire, assign it a higher score. So good, okay. We can say, hey, we are overestimating risk, always. We always don't call a healthy patient healthy. We always say they have chronic gingivitis. Let's lower it. Let's give ourselves a handicap, like golf, right? Give yourself a handicap. Say, yes, I'm going to assign so I can lower it, right? But then here's the worst story. People with high risk, people consistently underestimated their risk. Look at where most of the people. So when you have high risk, people consistently underestimated risk. So with these six data points, it's clear that we're not doing a great job, right? So, so risk assessment is is great. It's like, you know, I always tell people, it's like the gingival index. We say GI1, GI2, GI3, but what is GI1? Or what is GI2? Less bleeding, more bleeding, more redness, more swelling. If I didn't have coffee, everything is GI2. If I had coffee, everything is GI1, right? So, so <laughs> it's basically how happy you feel or how good you feel. It's, the number is great. You're giving it a number, but what goes to develop that number is very subjective. It's not as objective as it sounds. So that is something that we always want to remember in what we do, right? There is human error. So let's take this and we'll use it in the driving example that I just gave you some time ago, correct? So my name is Pranima. I'm texting while driving, I'm honest. So this is my second text today. I've been texting for 10 seconds and I'm driving on a highway, which is I-95, right? So if you take the statistics and you put it into this, this national fatality, it will give you a score. So because I've been texting for, for uh, oh, this is my second text, my chance of getting into an accident is 4.6%, right? Each second, I've been texting for 10 seconds, so it is 9%, it went up, correct? So I'm gonna go on, I'm gonna go on. I don't know, I'm driving on a highway, how much does it increase my text? I don't know, it's higher than a side street, but there's no value. So if I add up all of this, I'm supposed to get into an accident one in six times, 14%, 15%, which is about one in six times, let's say, right? So every six times I text and drive, I'm supposed to get into an accident. So I was like, okay, I can take that, it's okay. But <laughs> the actual risk that the government website gives you is 48%. So the numbers you put in, the value you put in to what you get out are not exactly the same. And so, if you click on the next site, you say, okay, why? It will tell you this. Wait, we forgot to take other considerations. The speed of the vehicle. How fast were you driving? The distraction, the, the, you know, whether were you eating breakfast, were you putting on makeup, were you doing other things, were you talking to your neighbor, right? So distractions becomes very important things. The driving condition, was it raining, was it foggy, was it misty, was the road icy? We didn't take that into consideration. 
the make or the vehicle, the only vehicle that's safe for driving is a Tesla. So I keep telling him, he has a Tesla. I'm like, I text and drive. Can I have my car? My husband has a Tesla. Tesla, I'm like, please give me the Tesla so I can drive it because I text and drive. He's not giving it to me. So, so that's not working. But you know, gender. Males are supposed to be more liable than females. So we have all of these unknown. And then the website will tell you there are many other factors that have not yet been discovered. There are a lot of blank boxes. But still, your texting and driving risk increases significantly, which is where we are today. If we use those six factors, we either overestimate disease or underestimate disease. So we need to fill all of these blank boxes, right? The more boxes we fill, the more accurate we can estimate risk, and therefore the more efficiently we can tell our patients, do this, do that. Yes, you can do this. No, you cannot do that. This is maybe okay. You can do this. You know, there's a range in doing this, or this is an absolute no-no. We can start telling them that. So, so I'm going to talk a little bit about that. So I'm now going to talk to you about what we have done in this environment, what we believe, what we truly believe, and we all know this, is that we're all born with a microbiome. Six minutes after you're born, your mouth is colonized with bacteria. Six minutes. That's all it takes, right? That's all it takes. And so you have a normal microbiome. You cannot say, I don't want bacteria in my mouth. I'm going to destroy all the bacteria in my mouth. That's not going to happen. You have a normal microbiome. It is a it is part of you. It is your second genome, in fact, right? We don't know what is normal. We say normal microbiome. We say healthy microbiome. What is it? What makes you normal? Why is your microbiome different than mine? You're healthy. I'm healthy. Why is it different, right? What makes us different? And But we are both healthy. So is your health the same as my health? Or worse, if you have a patient of Indian origin in your chair, and you have a way of changing their microbiome, are you going to bring them to my microbiome or are you going to bring them to something of Brazilian standards? And will that work for that patient? Think about it. All the data we have today, large amount of data we have today, the databases are all based on white American populations, white USA populations, right? There is nothing about anybody else. So if we say you're healthy, how do we even define healthy gingiva? Coral pink in color. I don't have coral pink in color. Uh, I mean, I can't. Look at my skin color. I can't have coral pink color. What, what definitions are these? What meanings are this, right? We don't even know what our definitions of health are. And so, so the whole thing is this. And what I'd like you to believe today is, is I'm going to talk to you about this microbiome that is evolving with us. It has, you know, man came on Earth. 100,000 years ago, maybe 200,000 years ago, depending on what data you look at. And the microbiome has been formed since then. And based on whether what food we ate, we went from being caveman to hunter-gatherer to gatherer. We have changed to modern man. The microbiome is constantly evolving with us, right? And when you talk about evolution, I want to bring about the story of what is known as the speckled moth. This is one of Darwin's most famous discoveries. This is one of Darwin's absolutely most famous discoveries, the story of the speckled moth. Have you read that in your biology books when you were? Yes? Many of you have, right? Good. So for those of you who have it, I will tell you this very, very quickly. The speckled moth used to look like that, like a, you know, salt and pepper, white moth with black dots on it, so speckled, right? Then, and it was, it was a very common moth in England until the Industrial Revolution. When the Industrial Revolution came, what happened? They started burning coal. So smoke became the biggest thing. So all the marble buildings that were in, in England started becoming black. All the brick buildings started becoming black. So the speckled moth was very easily being eaten away by all the birds. They saw it as a bright white moth. They were being eaten away. So the moth was dying out. What did the moth do? In response to this human behavior, the moth changed its color, and that is the speckled moth today. The modern speckled moth is a black moth, simply because industrial revolution forced that evolution, right? So the revolution forced the evolution. Now I'm hoping to show you some data today that shows how human behaviors are forcing the evolution of the microbiome, of the human microbiome, 
and in some direct, some states, this microbiome evolution is going towards the wrong side, and therefore it is increasing our risk for disease. So, so really, that is that is what we're trying to do, and I'll show you some data that supports this, or maybe not, or at least helps us think in that nature, right? So, we started asking, why do we host a microbiome? Why do we keep these bacteria with us, right? Clearly, this is not simply because we're good people, we're not good humans. Human beings are never good. We have a selfish reason. So, why are we doing this, right? And so, basically, this is what, uh, uh, this is setting the stage. We do a lot of these studies. You guys don't need to know this. You know exactly what I'm talking about. So we go from clinical studies to DNA sequencing, RNA sequencing, metabolomics, all of these things, and we do that. Let's get out of that so I can actually spend some time. All right. So one thing we found was that the healthy microbiome, the healthy microbiome is, we keep it simply because it costs us nothing. It has no cost to us. They are like good Airbnb hosts. When you go, you, you, when you leave the house, you clean everything up, you don't throw parties, you don't play loud music, you don't turn on your TV loud, you're a good guest, right? You go, you keep the house clean, and you leave. So people rent, will rent to you again and again and again, right? So, so you get a good rating on Airbnb, and you can stay there, right? So similar to that, this microbiome is low maintenance. So if you have a healthy microbiome, the characteristic of a healthy microbiome, so I'm going to show you what this is. This is known as a keg map. Basically, this is all the metabolic pathways that we use in our body. So if you look at it, just to orient you, see this circle here? This is Krebs cycle, oxidative phosphorylation. Remember the TCA cycle that you all read? So this is energy metabolism, aerobic respiration here, right? So this is energy metabolism. This is lipid metabolism. This is carbohydrate metabolism. This is all the cofactors, enzymes, and catalysts that you use. So here is amino acid metabolism is sitting there, so all of these things. This is secondary metabolites, things that you don't want in your body. This quadrant here is all kinds of products that can cause strong immune reactions like flagella, um, endotoxin, all of this. So basically this and this. So what we've done is we've taken this map and we, took, we sequenced the microbiome and these green lines are what is found in a healthy microbiome. So you can see that the healthy microbiome is a very simple, is a very simple biome, functionally very simple. It doesn't matter if you have strep oralis and I have strep sanguis or somebody has vianella or somebody else has Neisseria, it doesn't matter. The main thing, the reason why we all have these different species is because all of these species do one thing. They have one thing in common. They take small, small, they take, here, let's go back. They take single one carbon molecules, simple sugars, and they break it down by oxidative phosphorylation. Who remembers biochemistry? One molecule of glucose gives you how many molecules of ATP? 32 to 34, right, if you go through the aerobic respiration. So they can break down one molecule of glucose once a day. They can do cell machinery. They can do cell cycle. They can do transport. They can do cell division, they can do cell multiplication, that's all the energy they need. So it's a very quiet cell, right? So they do oxidative, uh, oxidative phosphorylation using simple proteins, simple carbohydrates. They have very, very few byproducts because energy transfer, one molecule equals 32 molecules, there is really no energy lost in heat, there is no fermentation, it's a straightforward thing. So they have a very, very low you know, energy transfer, right? And they have very few immuno, immunogenic molecules, no flagella, no li polysaccharides, very little of that. So this is a low immunogenic environment. So this is why they're very low maintenance to us. The second reason why we have, we carry this microbiome is because we are familiar with it. And I'll show you some studies that, that lead us to believe that. So, Basically, this is a study that one of our, our people did, uh, Matt Mason, one of my grad students did, and what this is looking at is <coughs> babies with no teeth, pre-dentate, primary dentition, mixed dentition, and permanent dentition. Don't read any of these. This doesn't matter. Just me shows you the species that are present in baby teeth, primary, mixed, and permanent. So what you can basically see 
is that 85% of, of species that were found in pre-dentate, before teeth came up, are carried into the adult dentition. Some bacteria need teeth to colonize. For example, what is the best way of eradicating PG from your mouth? Extractions. Because organisms like Parfumonas gingivalis, Trypanema denticola, require teeth to colonize, right? So you have the second set of teeth. Here you can see this. Here is Parfumonas. There it is, Parfumonas. So all of these species, dent Rothia dentocariosa, the ones, you know, so all of these need teeth. So a second set of organisms is acquired when teeth erupt in the primary dentition, and about 45% of this is carried through. So essentially, the adult microbiome, 90% of the adult microbiome is established before two years of age. And why is two very important? When does immune maturation happen? Two to two and a half years of age, right? So before your immune system is completely mature, these bacteria colonize. So every time your hygienist goes in and cleans your teeth, a new microbiome establishes, it comes back from this group of foundational species. Why am I telling you this? This calls into question what we do with probiotics. This is the reason why every time I drink this glass of water, every bacteria in this glass of water doesn't colonize my mouth. We are protected, right? Fundamentally, the bacteria that will colonize you are the ones. Of course, you'll have differences as you go through age. You share partners. You do things. Things can happen. But that is a smaller species. The big, large group of organisms are fundamentally, foundationally established long before your immune system is established. So these are your primary colonizers. They train your immune system. Say, I am your friend. I was here long before you were an adult. Keep me. And every time you lose me, I will come back, keep me, recognize me, accept me. If you don't see me before you're two years of age, feel free to kick me out, right? So this is immune surveillance. This is the most important concept of immune surveillance. And I'll talk to you about how this increases risk in a few minutes here. So that, so functionally stable. And the important thing to remember is that the microbiome is not the same throughout the human body. There are specific evolutionary reasons in different mucosal surfaces. So basically, you are looking at different microbiomes. Same woman, same woman, same female. The rectal microbiome is here. The vaginal microbiome is here, which are two completely. These two areas are separated by two centimeters, maybe, but they are completely different microbiomes. Here is the oral microbiome, and look at where the skin microbiome is sitting. So mucosal surfaces are much more similar than integumentary surfaces, and, and within mucosal surfaces, there are equal distances, so it's not geographic distance. These are two ends of the body, but the distance of the vagina from the rectum is equal to the distance of the vagina from the oral cavity. So there are specific reasons, evolutionary reasons, why certain habitats are colonized by certain biomes, right? Habitat specificity. This, again, you have seen, many of you have seen this. This is all microbiome of the implant. The blue and the red are implants. This is implants with, uh, which are healthy. The blue are implants which are healthy. The red are implants with disease. But they are much closer to each other than healthy teeth or teeth with periodontitis. So implant versus teeth are much more different than implant with health or disease, right? So that is the biggest separation. It's not that healthy implants are similar to disease implants. It's just that the disease from, or the distance from teeth is so much greater that you cannot see the differences between healthy and disease implants. So the material, the, that colonization makes a big difference, right? So we said, okay, titanium, that's maybe the key. So we looked at the same patient, titanium in the mouth, titanium in the hip, completely different microbiomes. It doesn't matter if you have titanium in the body, it's not the same. So what colonizes titanium in the mouth does not colonize titanium implants in the hip, same person, same you know, uh, uh, synergistic circulation, doesn't matter. So it's not, it's very complex. The, re, the, the message I want to bring to you is that it is very, very, very complex. It's not as simple as, oh, it's titanium material. So when you do a titanium disc outside the body, it is not the same as whether the titanium goes in the mouth or whether it's going in the hip or whether it's a knee replacement. They're all completely different environments. The, um, the other thing, no, that, that's not, okay. So then we said, okay, what makes you, you, right? Why, why are you, what is your microbiome yours? So genetics, we've always talked about genetics. And so in Ohio, we go, we live in the great state of Ohio where we have a city called Twinsburg. 
So Twinsburg was established by twin brothers, and every year in Twinsburg, we have a Twins Days Festival. So 9,000 pairs of twins, 9,000 pairs of twins come to the study every year, and some of them have been coming back for 30 years. So, so we get both cross-sectional as well as longitudinal samples. My youngest twin was one day old. Think about that for a minute. To have your baby today and to bring them to the festival tomorrow morning, yes. <laughs> I know, I know. I was like, wow, you're dedicated. So, and the, my oldest twin is 91 years old. So this is the range of samples we get, right? And so it allowed us to do something very important. It allowed us to categorize these so the first time we did the study, we looked at monozygotic, dizygotic twins, fraternal and identical twins. And I am a twin mom. My, I, ha I have fraternal twins. So, so this is why I knew about Twins Days Festival, because I went there with my twins simply to participate, and then we went as a researcher, right? But so we first looked at all the data. We compared monozygotic to dizygotic. The fundamental um, null hypothesis here is if genetics plays a role in bacterial acquisition in determining a microbiome, then people with identical genetics must have very similar microbiomes. People with non-identical genetics must have different microbiomes, right? Which means monozygotic twins must have much more similar microbiome than dizygotic twins, correct? We looked at the data, no difference. We published our first paper, you will see it, it's Papa Postolo et al. in J Clinical Perio many years ago. We said, oh, Microbiome is not different between monozygotic and dizygotic twins, published it. Then we went back, we collected more samples, and we said, wait. Then Matt Mason published a study about primary dentition, pre-dentate, all of these differences, right? So we said, wait, the, the, the bacteria vary by dentition. What did we do by putting all of these people together and looking at them together? Makes no sense. So we went back and stratified our data based on whether they are babies, pre-dentate, primary, mixed, you know, we did that. And so what you're looking at here is degree similarity. So, so the y-axis is percentage similarity. That's 100% similar, 80%, and so on. So what we found was if you're an identical twin in the pre-dentate stage, there is an 80% similarity of the microbiome between identical twin pairs, and a much lower, about 50% similarity between non-identical twin pairs. You can still see that in the primary dentition, but by the time you come to mixed and permanent dentition, the effects of genetics cannot be seen anymore. So lifestyle takes over, right? So the effect of genetics can be seen in pre-dentate and primary dentitions, but is absent by the time you come to a um, young adult, I mean, teen or young adult situation, right? So, so that is what we found. That was the first thing we found until the primary dentition. Then we said gender, of course. If you look at genetics, the next thing is gender, right? So here, you're looking at males and females, and, and we found that there's really no difference. You can't see two different clusters, right? They're all on top of each other. So yeah, men are not from Mars, women are not from Venus in terms of microbiome. It doesn't happen. Then we looked at race, ethnicity, and we found that you could actually differentiate between Caucasians and African Americans living in the United States with an almost 97% sensitivity and specificity. It was very, very good. So you can separate these two groups apart. So ethnicity does seem to play a role. And so then we said, let's talk about human behavior. So basically, what makes you, you? Genetics, maybe not gender, ethnicity, right? Ethnicity clearly plays a role. And the fact, whatever microbiome was colonized, colonized you before you were two years of age. So this is your endowment, this is who you are. Now let's add a human behavior to this. Let's take smoking, right? The first study we could do very easily was smoking. So you're looking at data from 100 smokers and 100 non-smokers. And what we found was that smokers have really low levels of these species. Don't try to read them, they're just a group of species here. And here are a group of species that are periodontal pathogens and the bottom list here is respiratory pathogens, oropharyngeal pathogens, right? So they have these. And so then we asked, okay, what is the significance of this group of species here? And what we found out, this group is the same as this group, the pre-dentate bacteria that you acquire before, you know, six months of age is what you lose when you're a smoker. So the familiar species are lost, the pioneer commensal organisms that form that long 
is lost when you start smoking. So that is how smoking alters the oral microbiome by removing familiar species. And so your body loses its sense of balance, right? Who am I? It asks the fundamental question. Your microbiome is now asking, who am I? Like a teenager, right? So, so it's trying to figure things out. And so that's what happens. And then we looked at this and we said, okay, does smoking affect different ethnicities differently? So we said, now we're playing this game of rock, paper, scissors, right? How many of you know rock, paper, scissors? You all know what rock, paper, scissors is, right? Rock, paper, scissors. Which wins? Yes. So now we're going to play this game of rock, paper, scissors. So we said, OK, ethnicity. We know ethnicity has a huge influence on the microbiome. So the question then is, are African Americans more affected by smoking than Caucasians, for example? And the answer is, if you're a non-smoker, we can tell the Caucasian apart from the African American. But when you start smoking, that vanishes. So smoking supersedes the effects of ethnicity. So when you start a human behavior, that changes your ethnic, your, your genetic endowment, right? So, so it changes the effects of this one. So then, rock, paper, scissors in terms of ethnicity and, and, and smoking. Um, smoking, where is it? Ah, here. Let's look at gender. Remember this? I said gender has no difference on the microbiome. Okay, this is all people all together. I'm gonna to separate this based on smoking. Here are females. Female smokers are pink. Female non-smokers are clear. You can see that there is no difference, right? Here are males. So male smokers, being male and a smoker is more detrimental to your microbiome than being female and smoker. So in this game of rock, paper, scissors, gender wins, right? So, so now you've started adding risk, right? If you look at a smoker in your chair, what are you gonna ask? What is your ethnicity? What is your gender? Or if you have someone of African-American origin in your chair, you're gonna look and say, are they female, are they smokers? So we're adding layers to this risk, risk story, right? It's not single, it's multiple factors. And so then we said, okay, this is a cross-sectional study. So this is Sukirt's data. He did a smoking cessation study. And so this is how we did the study. We took a bunch of periodontally healthy, so, so no attachment loss, those kinds of people, right? We took these people and we gave them smoking cessation. Some of them quit, some of them did not quit. So everybody came in, we took a baseline sample, and then we did a scaling, we did a scaling and profi polish on them. So we did an oral prophylaxis on all of them, right? So from baseline, the next visit we saw them was after profi, one group had quit, one group did not quit. And there was a healthy group that never smoked at all, so that's our control group. So, so here you're looking at three different colors, right? You see the green, this is people who never smoked at all, this is our control population. This orange group here is people who were smoking at baseline but quit. The red is people who were smoking at baseline but never quit. All three groups after baseline, they got a cleaning. So as soon as you clean, so the, fir the first visit is baseline, the second visit is two weeks after cleaning, right? So does that make sense to everybody? And then we followed them over six months. So I'm gonna show you one person in each group. So we're gonna follow this person, and we're gonna see how their microbiome shifts after they get a cleaning, but because they've never smoked, they did nothing else, right? So watch where that goes. Let's see if it plays, right? So it starts there. After cleaning, the microbiome shifts all the way and six months after, the mic uh, after cleaning, it comes back very, very close to where they started, right? So the microbiome comes back similar to where you were when you started. When you quit smoking, this orange guy here, and you clean their teeth so they travel all the way across the world, and that is where that person lands. So when you quit smoking and someone does a cleaning for you, it seems to have a very good effect, yes? You say, oh, both groups shifted, but let me show you what happens when you clean a smoker's mouth. Oh, sorry, wrong one, that. Really nothing, right? They started where they are, they stayed where they are, so they don't move, right? So smoking cessation is far more important than oral prophylaxis moral of the story. I mean, these are clinically healthy people. They are only 20 to 27 years of age. These are our young adults, right? And, and they think they can walk in front of a bus and they won't die. 
So these are people who don't believe that death happens to them. They are immortal at this age, but that's what happens, right? So that. Then we looked at diabetes. We said, okay, let's look at, look at diabetes. And the diabetics are in blue. The controls are almost always in green in all of our studies. You can see that diabetics separate from, from non-diabetics, right? And this is HbA1c of less than 6.5, less than or equal to 6.5, 6.5 to 10, greater than 10. So you see that there is a beautiful dose response in terms of uh, hyperglycemia and the microbiome. So the microbiome responds to levels of hyperglycemia, not just hyperglycemia alone, right? So then we said, okay, let's start thinking about obesity. What does obesity do to you? Sorry. Obesity, you're looking at three groups here. This is orange is overweight, yellow is obese, and this is normal, BMI of greater than 25. But then, this is what we found. When we separated this data into males and females, this is non-obese and obese males, the yellow and orange here. This is the obese and non-obese females. So remember, smoking affected who? Males. Obesity affects female microbiome. So, so here's the story, right? So then we said, okay, let's compare obesity with diabetes. The obese individual's microbiome is very sim similar to the diabetic individual's microbiome. So I'm going to call obesity as pre-diabetic in terms of its shifts on the microbiome. So obesity is really not good news. And think about it, this is obesity, BMI greater than 25. This is not BMI greater than 30. This is BMI greater than 25. So this is overweight and obese people, everybody together. So 25 seems to be a really bad number. So that is what is happening here, right? And remember those bariatric surgeons I showed you? They were getting all of these people and stapling their stomachs. So we were following them for a whole year. So let me explain this graph, how to read this graph for you for a second. So this is looking at fold change. This is, this is a metagenomic analysis, so lots of different bacterial genes are listed here. This is fold change, so this is the zero line. The red line is the zero line, no change. This is present at baseline, so if you see all dots here are present at baseline, are higher in baseline. All dots below this line are higher at two weeks. If it is red, it is significantly different. So you see that from baseline to two weeks, there are some bacterial genes that, and there some red dots here that are changing. At three months, you can see that there is a whole group of bacteria that are bacterial genes that are shifting. At six months, that shift happens in the opposite direction and that stabilizes at 12 months. So following bariatric surgery from six months onwards, up to six months, there is fluctuation at six months, the microbiome stabilizes following bari bariatric surgery. So, so essentially, bariatric surgery works to shift the oral microbiome, which means not just not cross-sectionally, but also longitudinally, there is a difference that you can establish between obesity and non-obese individuals. Okay, then we said, all right, we know diabetes and smoking are both risk factors for periodontitis, and 24% of diabetics smoke and 10% of smokers are diabetic. So if you can't die one way, you can die both ways, right? So this is like that song, 50 Ways to Die. So, so <laughs> right? Purple, what is that? Purple Zion, purple Zion, she fell in front of a purple, whatever. So something like that, right? So, so this is like that. So then this is what we did. So again, same story. You're looking at three groups, smoker, diabetic, diabetic smoker. So you see that the diabetic smoker is sitting up all the way there. But one thing we learned was the distance between a diabetic smoker and a diabetic is much less than the distance between a diabetic smoker and a smoker. So, you know, the effects of diabetes seems to be much greater on the environment than smoking is. To me, this is very good news. If I have a diabetic smoker, I can at least get them on medication and get them to improve their microbiome and therefore their oral health rather than trying to get them to quit smoking. To me, at least there is some silver lining in this cloud, right? So, so that seemed like good news, so that. And what is this? Oh yes, so this is the same thing. So we are looking at a non-smoker, non-diabetic, no, oh, a normal weight non-smoker, 
overweight non-smoker, obese non-smoker, normal weight smoker, normal weight diabetic, and obese smoker. So, so this is smoking and obesity. We looked at both of these together. And what we found was smoking overwhelms the effects of obesity. So if you're a smoker and you're obese, you have to quit smoking. Losing weight is not enough, right? You have to quit smoking. So, so these kinds, so we started looking at multiple variables in this. Ah, then we come to the sad, sad, sad story. This is e-cigarettes. You people are very lucky. You don't have e-cigarettes here yet, but I, Dr. Yanato was just telling me you guys have hookah lounges, right? Don't even raise your hand if you've been to a hookah lounge. I don't want to know. Don't do it. The answer is don't do it. Please don't. Hookah is smoking is just as bad, and vaping is just as bad or even worse than smoking. So here you're looking at e-cigarettes, smoking, controls. E-cigarettes can influence the microbiome. The effect is different from smoking, but it can influence the microbiome. What does it do? So this is a triplot. This is called a triplot. Here is a smoker. Here is a non-smoker. Here is an e-cigarette user. And you can see these dots. As these dots, these are genes. If they are present towards this, this part of the triangle, they are higher in an e-cigarette user. If they are present on that part of a triangle, they are higher in a smoker. So you see what, what I mean, right? If they're just present in the center here, it means nothing. So e-cigarettes have higher levels of ECM, gram-positive cell wall, LPS, iron acquisition, motility and chemotaxis, quorum sensing, stress response, and wait for this, resistance to antibiotics. So your e-cigarette user is not going to be cured by you writing that antibiotic or putting them on the chlorhexidine mouthwash, right? It's how do we increase resistance to antibiotics? We always tell patients, if you don't take your antibiotic course, you will be resistant to antibiotics, right? Because a resistant species will grow and will become. But there is even more a simpler way of becoming resistant to antibiotics. How does an antibiotic work? It has to enter the cell. And either it works on the RNA, the transcription, or it works on the DNA machinery, right? So it has to enter the cell. Bacteria have fantastic mechanisms for kicking out. They have what are called efflux pumps. If they don't like it, you're gone. Right? They will throw you out. They have very, very highly developed efflux pumps. Remember, they were on Earth when there were volcanoes, there were radiation. All of these things were happening on Earth when bacteria were still present on Earth, right? So because of these efflux pumps, when you smoke an e-cigarette and you have so much cadmium or formaldehyde and it enters the cell, the bacteria develops these high, they, they upregulate their efflux pumps. So they upregulate their efflux pumps to kick out all of these noxious elements from cigarette smoke, from, from this one, all of this, right? So then, when you swallow an antibiotic on top of that, the bacterial efflux pumps are already set up. They know how to kick, out, kick everything out. They will kick your antibiotic out. So that's the simplest way, not because you took an antibiotic, you're resistant to it, simply because bacteria now have developed a highly functioning system to kick out everything. You have upregulated transmission of everything that can be kicked out. They see cadmium, they throw it out. They see iron, they throw it out. They see zinc, they throw it out. They see an antibiotic, they throw it out. Done. So you have trained your bacteria to become a superman, right? You made it the superbug because you have been doing this human behavior. So, so this is really what I want people to understand because we shouldn't always say antibiotic resistance is when you don't complete a course of antibiotics. That is not even true anymore. There's no course of antibiotics. Antibiotic resistance happens when you do stupid things like teach your bacteria how to get rid of noxious products. We are training these bacteria, right? So, so that is what is happening here. Okay, the other thing we did, and I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this, is to see if e-cigarettes can be used to quit smoking. No, don't do it. So e-cigarettes are maybe a great tool to quit smoking, but then you will have a new addiction. You're not quitting smoking, you're developing e-cigarette addiction. So decide, would you rather be a smoker or a vapor, right? So that's the thing you want to remember with this. Okay, this is another thing that we did. We, so, so because I do a lot of, lot of um, alloderm in my practice, I have the opportunity of giving patients one seven-day course of antibiotics and following them over six months. So I collected samples on patients who took an antibiotic at baseline, followed them at two weeks, six weeks, and three months. So seven days of antibiotic use, 
shifts the microbiome completely for three months. In three months, the microbiome has not come back, right? We did another study where we gave the patients, oh, so, so, so yeah, same thing. So this is the same study, and we said, okay, what is different? What is different? Remember I was talking to you about these efflux pumps? See how much of the efflux pumps are upregulated. So the black ones are controls, people who never took antibiotics over 12 weeks, and this is a group that took the antibiotics. See, at one week, the efflux pumps goes up. At 12 weeks, the efflux pumps stays up all the time, right? So basically, the bacteria are kicking out your antibiotics. They start it as soon as the course of the antibiotic stops. At two weeks, it goes up like that and it stays on for 12 weeks. So at three months after a single course of seven day course of antibiotics, your microbiome has not come back to normal. So, so you can't repeat that antibiotic in three months. It won't work for this patient, right? It's gonna be highly ineffective. And then we did a study where we did two stage implants. And at Ohio State, the protocol is, at the time of implant placement, we give the patient two grams of amoxicillin, one hour before treatment or two hours before treatment, two grams. We place the implant and no antibiotic after that. If the patient is systemically healthy, no problems, right? And then in three months, we come back and we open the cover screw and, and do a, this is a two-stage implant, right? So we open up the cover screw and then, and, then, and then we build the superstructure on top of it. So this is what my resident Nicholas did. He, he did this study and what he did was he collected at the time of cover screw opening, a second stage surgery, he collected fluid from inside the cover screw and then he followed this. So this is development of the peri-implant microbiome, right? Because you gave the patient the two gram antibiotic at one hour before placement, at three months, there is this upregulation of antibiotic genes. So this is like a culture table, right? A small culture chamber that you have developed inside that. You gave the antibiotic, you put the bacteria from saliva, you put your cover screw in three months that have been growing. The good news is, as soon as you remove the cover screw, everything goes back to normal. But there is an opportunity for even a single, single antibiotic, if you leave it like that, to, to cause changes. That's really what I want to show you with this slide. And so we said, okay, everybody talks, oh, so the microbiome shifted, the microbiome shifted, great. So what? Can there not be an altered normal? So we took all of this data. We had rheumatoid arthritis, diabetes. I didn't show you a lot of this data, but, but we have all of these subjects. So when we combine all of these subjects, we have 3,867 subjects. And we have been looking at this. And this is the healthy microbiome of the normal person. I'm going to say normal. I'm going to just say the word normal. Someone who never doesn't drink, doesn't smoke, has not vaped, is not diabetic. You know, that, that perfect person, the goody tissues, right? So, so this is that person. This is a disease microbiome, our periodontitis microbiome, which we have sequenced. So we're going to compare the distance that it takes to go from here to here and what shifts your risk towards this distance. Just going to keep playing it. We did a study on pregnancy. Pregnancy shifts the microbiome. It doesn't come back to normal for one year. The post-pregnancy microbiome doesn't come back to normal till one year, okay? Single course of antibiotics shifts it. So this is quartiles, right? This is the four quartiles. So one, 25%, 50%, 75% chance, and 100% chance. Does that make sense to everybody? So it brings single course of antibiotics, increases, moves your microbiome towards disease about 25% of the way. Obesity also moves it about 25% of the way. Rheumatoid arthritis moves it closer to 50% closer to disease than it is to, to health. Smoker with rheumatoid arthritis moves it past the 50%. Smoker is there. Hyperglycemia is on the other side of the 50%. Smoker on antibiotics, right, starts moving. A hyperglycemic, a diabetic smoker starts moving. An obese hyperglycemic has started completely tipping towards disease. There's almost a point of no return, I would say, at this point, that an obese is, is moving towards disease. There's an obese smoker. There's an e-cigarette user. This is a 22-year-old child who has been using e-cigarettes for six months. I'm telling you, you know, the way I did the study, I have, my twins are now 9, 22. They were 19 when I did the study. You remember this. I told Taruni and Tanvi, I was like, hey, I'm doing the study. Do you want do you have any friends? We recruited 75% of our students, of our subjects, from Taruni and Tanvi's friends. Three of them, I have driven to soccer practice when they were in kindergarten and second grade. One of them looks at me and says, Mrs. Kumar, are you going to tell my mom? <laughs> I was like, you idiot, you signed the consent form. I can't tell your mom. But sit down. I will be your mom today. Sit down. Let me talk to you, <laughs> right? So, so 
these are young, young, young people. They're doing it because it's cool. And look at where they are. Look at where they are. To me, it's scary. Six months. They've used e-cigarettes for six months. That's all they've done. And if they're fat on top of that, I know. I know. The story. And there's a smoker who is a dual user. That person. That, that person, I don't even know what they're doing anymore, right? So, so really, this is, this is truly what we're looking at. This is what we're trying to do with risk. Just understand what drives your risk towards disease, right? So, so, and there's an obese hyperglycemic smoker. So as you add more and more and more human behaviors to this, we see that we are shifting, we're tipping the balance more towards disease than towards health. Right? So that, maybe I have any more points? No, that's it. Okay, I am gonna finish with this one story here. I really want to talk about the story because I know you guys are working in this space. So remember this picture. This picture comes up all the time. I'm showing this too many times today. But remember this picture? We talked about your microbiome is established when you are before two years of age. The second question we asked was, where is this microbiome coming from? All right, we found that it comes from the mum right, the baby micro, the pre-dentate microbiome. After that, it starts shifting. The child's lifestyle, other things take, but basically the fundamental, we had the pre-dentates were zero to one week old babies. So one day to one week old babies. So within the first week of your life, your microbiome is acquired from your mom, right? As we were doing the study, we did one more thing. That should, that should say smoking, not obese. We looked at women who smoke, and we looked at their babies. So women who smoke during their pregnancy, the babies have a different microbiome than women who did not smoke during pregnancy. And I was telling about Kazine. She's also looked at women who took antibiotics during pregnancy. Their babies have a different microbiome than, so maternal smoking and maternal antibiotics seem to play a giant role in influencing the child's microbiome. And so we said, okay, if these children are different, how are they different, right? We found that these children carry lots of Fusobacterium nucleatum and Campylobacter concisus in their pre-dentate microbiome. The first slide I showed you, I said Fusobacterium nucleatum needs a tooth to colonize. It doesn't show up till the primary dentition. These children are getting FNUC even before they have teeth. So they're starting early, they're starting in pathogen-rich environments very, very early simply because their mom smoked. So then we said, okay, what is the story here? Is this because the mom smokes and so, you know, the child is in a smoking environment? Egia Zaura, no, no, Christine Argard published this beautiful work, beautiful work where she showed that the placenta actually has a microbiome. It's not a sterile environment. And the placental microbiome is a complete subset of the oral microbiome, not the gut, not the vagina, not the skin, not the... Uh, uh, year, but the oral microbiome. So the placental microbiome is completely derived from the oral microbiome. So Egia Zara published another thing. What she showed was, or what she summarized, this is actually a summary article, this is a beautiful study. So what happens is, the placenta has a blood-brain barrier, right? It has a barrier which filters everything. It has a barrier here. So bacteria are not going to be able to go from the maternal placenta to the child. But what happens is, at this edge of the barrier, whatever bacteria are stuck on the mother's side of the microbiome teaches the child's immune system, the T reg cells of the child's immune system to recognize them as friends. So if your baby has seen these bacteria before they were born, when you, the child is born, they will accept these bacteria as friends because the immune system has already been trained. If all they see are strep oralis and strep mite, my, my, mitis and, and strep salivarius and Neisseria, you're okay, which is what most of our babies see. But if they see Fusobacterium nuclearum or Parfumonas gingivalis, and when the baby is born and the mother takes out the spoon from her mouth and sticks it in the baby's mouth, what is the baby's microbiome going? What is the baby's immune system going to say? I've already seen you. I know you. Yes, you're a friend. Stay with me. Right? 
So the risk for disease is not when this child grows up to be a 40-year-old person. The risk for disease is the mother of the child. So I think the risk for periodontitis starts much before. It might, the genetic endowment that we talk about might not be a genetic endowment. It might simply be intrauterine transmission or intrauterine education. We don't know. This is very early data. I'm not going to say anything on this. But we really need to start thinking in these angles and start targeting pregnant women or women who are going to get pregnant. I mean, if when your pregnancy test is positive, what do they tell women? Oh, you need to take prenatal vitamins. You can get spina bifida. You need to get folic acid. Shouldn't they get a cleaning? Right? I mean, th this to me is, is the scariest part, that really we're targeting the wrong population. We're targeting the child after they become a 40-year-old adult. But we should have targeted the mother before the child was born, right? So, so maybe that is where we should be headed. So, so education, public education of pregnant and pre-pregnant women seems to be, to me, very, very key. Same thing. If this is what I was telling you, if the mother took antibiotics, the child's microbiome shifts. The mother smokes, the child's microbiome shifts, right? And so basically the data I have been showing you is, has another role to play, right? All of these people that I showed you in this rock, paper, scissors game, <laughs> They are all periodontally healthy people. So every person I showed you here, nobody had periodontal disease. These are patients we look in our practice and say, good job, come back in six months, right? These are periodontally healthy people, except that they have behavioral risk factors. But they have, which shows us that systemic and environmental factors can have a very, very early impact on the oral microbiome, long before the body says, oh my gosh, there's trouble here, I'm gonna have cancer, I'm gonna do this. The microbiome has responded to this. The microbiome has shifted in ways, and we can measure this shift. So it's measurable, and it's specific for each factor. The obesity-associated microbiome is not the same as the smoking-associated microbiome. It's not the same as, as the rheumatoid microbiome. They are different. So you can measure it based on the exposure that this patient is having, which means that they can truly become an early warning system, like a canary in the coal mine, right? The coal miners just decide if there's a gas, poisonous gas is coming out of a cave, what do they do? They take a canary. As long as the bird is singing, there is no gas. If the bird dies because it you know, smelled the gas, because the bird's lung is so much smaller than the human lung, the humans can walk out much faster, right? So a canary singing was an important, because you can't see, the coal mine is dark. So the only way is to hear the bird's song. So, so you heard the bird's song, you knew all was okay. When the bird stopped singing, you knew there was trouble and you headed right out because the bird's lung responded much faster than the human lung can respond. Maybe our microbiome is our indicator. Maybe we should be looking for microbial biomarkers and not really for you know other systemic biomarkers because they take much longer to happen, right? With a cytokine, we're measuring inflammation after it has happened. We're measuring host response. We should never forget, we're measuring the response of the host. We're not measuring something primary. I'm not saying we shouldn't measure cytokines, but we truly should, or we should look at the interaction between these two, which is some early work that we've started doing, and we can talk about this. So basically, I want to stop there. Your systemically compromised patients is, are not one size fits all. They need to have a personalized microbial therapy, and I will stop there. Questions? What happened? Come on, you dream. <laughs> yes. Very good. So, so yes, the number of cigarettes matter, and but we found that after a threshold of five pack day, nothing matters. So the difference, the biggest difference we found was between five pack a day smoker and less than five pack a day. After five pack a day, nothing matters. We couldn't find a difference at all. So. If you're looking at early microbiome changes, you know, younger people, that kind of thing, five pack a day seems to be the limit, and then they're done. So that was the biggest difference. We couldn't find a dose response. It see, almost seems to be all or none at that point after that. Yes. Hey, can I take two? Sure. Uh, recently, we have the publication uh, trying to link porphyromonas gingivalis and Alzheimer's disease. So I, I was wondering if you could comment about that. What do you think? Is this a cannery on, in the coal mine or something like that? Um, so, so that is a very, very beautiful paper. It's beautiful work and it's you know, looked at it in many different ways. 
So they have done it cross-sectionally, longitudinally, animal model, you know, biological, mechanistic work. So they've put together many, many different elements. So the evidence does seem to point to the fact that Portramonas gingivalis can be in the causal pathway, but I don't know that if it can be the only pathway or if, uh, again, like everything else, we might find that there are 50 different flavors of Alzheimer's, right? One might be the PG pathway induced because we know in the population that even with people with periodontal disease, PG is not present in 100% of them. So, so then how all people who are healthy, I'm, after I read the paper, I really thought I was gonna get Alzheimer's because I carry PG. I use my mouth as a culture chamber. So I carry PG in my mouth in very, very low levels. And I can actually cu culture it out of my own mouth, but I don't know if that ever says that I will, it raises more questions than it answers, but it is a fantastic first step. And I think we really need studies like that but it is not the answer. I think it's the beginning of the answer. So we have started spelling the alphabet with A now, and we know that there is an A. We don't know if there's a B and a C and a D after that, so at least we know there is an A, right? We don't know how the story is going to go, but we've started the story. So, so that's, that's a very impressive piece of work, brilliant. And of course, it's good to link an oral organism to something, but I don't know that it'll just be PG alone, considering that you know, we don't have so much PG. And even if it's present in disease, it's present in fairly low numbers. So, so George Hutchison Gallis would kill me for this, but <laughs> he's a friend, he'll live. Did you have a question? If you did. Uh, thank you, Professor. Uh, with these new tools to understand how the microbe works, uh, it could change our therapeutic approach in the future. Usually we are, we only think in eliminate or reduce the number of, of some pathogens or some species, and uh, we are seeing that we have uh, uh, several uh, features, several species there, but they are working different. Uh, you think the next steps for the therapeutic approach will be uh, try to eliminate, try or reduce specific, path specific species, or trying to find how to overlap this change in metabolism in what they are expressing uh, or how they are acting in the microbiome. Okay, so, so I'm gonna take the long answer to that, right? So, so some data that I didn't show you is this. We looked, at, we looked at 25 people with periodontitis and 25 healthy individuals. And what we found was this. One thing we found, many of them, um, when we looked at the species level data, it was very different, up and down, like popcorn. Some of them had high levels of PG, some had high levels of filifactralosis, some had, you know, all different things. Prevotella, some had capno, all different things. But one thing, and so, one thing we found, the big difference between health and disease was in certain metabolic pathways, right? We found, for example, let's take fermentation. So when you go from health to disease, why do you go from health to disease? I didn't put up that slide. One thing that we found is that you shift from aerobic respiration to fermentation. Right? The, the area becomes anaerobic. So you go from uh, aerobic respiration to uh, fermentation, which means you release a whole bunch of byproducts, butyrols, pyrons, short-chain fatty acids, you know, all kinds of acetaldehyde, anything. It's, like a septic tank, right? Now your, your gingiva is like a septic tank. Everything goes there, it's terrible. And so you start really getting, getting disease. So what we found was, if you take fermentation, it doesn't matter what species is present in disease, all of those species perform fermentation. So you're, you are in a site with disease, you're selected for a site to live in a site with disease based on your ability to ferment. It doesn't matter if you're a PG-based fermentation or if you're Prevotella-based fermentation or a Capno-based fermentation. If you can ferment, you will live in the disease site. If you will only live on aerobic respiration, you will die, right? So, so it is the function, it is the metabolic capability. It's a function capability that keeps you there. It also helps that the organisms that are good fermenters, for example, also have lots of LPS, lots of flagella. They're capable of chemotaxis. They're very good quorum sensors. 
So they also carry these additional properties. So, so I think there is microbial heterogeneity, which is why the microbial hypothesis went out, right? Because there's so much heterogeneity, we could never find a biomarker species. But maybe we can find a biomarker function. Iron acquisition, we, we struggle as humans for all these 200,000 years we have lived on Earth, what did we do? We kept sequestered iron. We prevented bacteria from getting iron for us, from, from the human body. Lactoferrin, lysozyme, everything is protective. Our innate immune system is trained to prevent bacteria from getting iron from us. And bacteria need iron. That is a primary, ferrodoxin is a primary respiratory pathway. They cannot breathe without iron, right? So they need iron for respiration. What do you do when you pick up a cigarette smoke? Four milligrams of free iron. Every cigarette you smoke gives four milligrams of free iron. It's like party time for bacteria, right? So they don't even have to fight for iron acquisition. You're changing. So any bacterium there can become a pathogen. You don't have to have PG in your mouth anymore to become or black pigmented bacteroides or anything to have disease. Your little Streptococcus oralis is becoming a pathogen because you gave it so much iron and it overgrew the system. So you can take a nice commensal fundamental pioneer species and make it a pathogen by changing human behavior, by changing bacterial metabolism and, and functions. And so human behavior can change that, right? So I think it is fundamentally a question of functionality. The environment selects. Same thing, if you're not a fish, you cannot live in the sea. So, so why is the sea full of fish? There are different types of fish, but they all share one single function. They have gills. They can breathe in water, right? Same story here. If you can live, breathe, and eat in that environment, you earned a place. If you cannot do it, goodbye, right? So, so I think functions are far more important than, than species. Yes, species are important. Yes, there are pathogens, but they are only pathogens because they survive in that particular environment. So commensal can become a pathogen. A pathogen can become meaningless because it doesn't have the right environment to succeed. So I feel like that is where the future is, that we should really start looking at metabolic pathways, proteome analyses, things like that to see where we are headed, right? That's what I think. <laughs> Any other questions? No, I told no. Okay, no, I know. Uh, it's dangerous. Uh, well, uh, I'd like to thank the professor for this lecture. I think it, uh, at the first view, it's very difficult. I feel difficult for the last seven years yet. Uh, I'm trying every day. <laughs> and uh, this, this point is difficult to me because I'm colorblind. So uh, depend on color, I, can, uh, I can't see anything there. That's why I but it was. Uh, <laughs> my students sometimes use green and red, just I can't see that. So. I, I have to believe in that. Uh, but it's very interesting. It's open new ways for, uh, for the periodontal, micro, and several uh, other area subjects. So I think it's very important we have contact with this technology, with these results, because I think it's the future. Uh, it's not the only future, but will be in our future for several years. So I really want to thank you for this opportunity to work together with you. I have another opportunity to, to thank you, but uh, in public in here, uh, thank you, you and everyone that come in different areas, prostodontics, it's histology, micro, genetic. And uh, I really hope that you enjoy the lecture as I enjoy. And again, thank you, give you a certificate. Fantastic, thank and you. And that's for us. Thank you for everybody. Uh, Professor Kamaru is stay with us until tomorrow. Uh, at this afternoon, we'll have the Mabel Defense. Everybody's invited. Uh, I think she will really like if we have everybody there. <laughs> but um, I would like to thank you again for everybody and invite if you want to see my belt fest. It's true. And uh, thank you again.